Good afternoon, evening, everyone. Welcome to Melbourne, which has suddenly decided to skip spring altogether and take us from winter directly into summer. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that we are meeting tonight on Wurundjeri land, the unceded territories of the Wurundjeri peoples, which is uh, an, a, a recognition that is something you can't take apart from understanding our political system because we consider Australians political, Australia's political history, we have to begin with the recognition that uh, this, this territory that we now call Australia was invaded, despite some of our national myths about uh, a peaceful settlement. Um, there were, in fact, several hundred Indigenous nations here that were fairly brutally invaded. We're still uncovering the histories of massacres that have been um, hidden and not talked about in this history uh, and, and that have um, been pushed to one side as we've constructed this new nation over the top. The reason for this invasion was to set up a series of penal colonies. Britain wanted to get rid of uh, its, its prisons, uh, prisoners, its prisons were overcrowded and so Australia received, or this territory received boatloads of people who were um, uh, housed in, in penal colonies, uh, set up in uh, related to areas that are now close to our state capital cities. And that was the situation until 1901 when Australia came together as a federation. So as a nation, Australia has only existed since 1901. Uh, I'm going to come back and talk about the constitution that was written uh, in 1901 or written in the, the lead up to 1901. Uh, but it's important to remember that in coming together um, as a nation, we again neglected to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of the territory. Uh, they weren't included in the discussions and the debates leading up to Federation and the only mention of them in the Constitution is in quite racist terms. Uh, hence we've been having a debate for the last decade or so about whether uh, and, and if and how to recognise Indigenous peoples in the Constitution. Now somewhat strangely, given that you probably haven't seen the Queen of England wandering the streets since you've been in Australia, we are still a constitutional monarchy. The Queen is still our head of state. The Australia Act that was uh, passed in 1986 uh, confirms Australia as a sovereign, independent and federal nation, so it confirms our political independence from Britain in, in the sense of the way in which we are governed, uh, but we haven't been able to take that step of becoming a republic. We had a referendum in 1999 on that question, uh, which for various complicated reasons that we might come back to, failed uh, quite spectacularly. Our current Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, was the head of the movement uh, for, to, for Australia to become uh, a republic and uh, He's, uh, I think, still somewhat embarrassed by that loss. So when this, the Australian Constitution was written and the, the colonies, the penal colonies, came together as uh, a federated uh, nation, we had to make up a political system. Uh, as I'm sure you are all aware from the various countries that you've, you've come from and other places you've travelled and have experience of, there's no template. Every country makes up its own political system and Australia did this uh, in the, the late 19th century. What we came up with here was a blend of two systems. So we took elements of US federalism, and I'll come back and explain what federalism is in more detail, and the British Westminster system. And we put these two systems together in ways that we thought would suit us very well. And we, we have since often referred to this as the Washminster mutation. Uh, we've taken elements of two systems and kind of put them together and hope that they worked. The, the principal anxiety of the colonies in, in coming together in a federation was that they would lose their power. They had, um, up until that moment in their existence, been quite independent, self-governing colonies um, with lots to do with one another, but um, quite uh, sovereign in their own rights in terms of decisions that they made, of course, with, with reference to um, the British Crown and the British Parliament. So a, a significant portion of the process of federation was figuring out how the colonies could join together in ways that would allow them to govern together 
um, as, as a, a, a nation, whilst also retaining some degree of their independent powers as, as states. And that's what we call uh, the, the division of powers, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But the other part of the power that was divided in writing our constitution was the separation of powers. So, uh, and I know that Bernadette's going to talk about this more when she comes to her lecture on the legal system. We both divided the power between the states and the federal government and we created the separation of powers between the three arms of government that are, are common to a Westminster system. So these are the, the legislature, the parliament, if you like, that makes the laws um, for the country, the executive, which puts those laws into operation. So the executive are the, the ministers uh, that are responsible for different government departments and the bu bureaucracy that works for them. And the judiciary, the, the judges and the legal system that then has to interpret those laws. So our system was created with those three separate arms that we call the separation of powers. <coughs> What's different about a Westminster system when we might compare it to something like a presidential system in the United States, is that two of those arms of, of government are partially fused. So the executive, that is the, the prime minister and the ministers, are also a part of the legisl legislature. They come from the parliament. So in the United States, the president, apparently some lunatic called Donald Trump at the moment, uh, appoints his cabinet. He chooses his executive. They may or may not be elected officials. They sometimes are, they mostly are not. They can be the uh, president's best mates. That's often the case. Uh, but these people are appointed to serve in the, in the president's cabinet. That cabinet, that executive is entirely separate from the US Congress, the US version of the parliament. In a Westminster system, that's not the case. Um, the, the prime minister and the ministers that he or she appoints uh, draws uh, that executive from the parliament. I'll come back and explain that further in a minute. Have a little look at how this separation of powers um, works in theory and uh, I know that, that Bernadette's going to explain this further. Uh, in the purple we have the executive government. Those uh, people in the dark purple at the top uh, we might think of as being the, the prime minister and uh, some of his or her ministers supported by the rest of the parliament and they, we elect them, we elect um, these parliamentarians and we, we create this executive government because we're giving them the power to make laws for us, to make laws for the rest of the country. Uh, the, the, the parliament uh, is, is the, the body that has to ratify and approve those laws. They have to come through the parliament, through in Australia, both houses and I'll come back to that. And then because no law is ever perfect, these laws are subject to tests in, in law. So they, they, cases are brought before uh, courts of different levels and the judiciary has the power to interpret the laws to say whether those are right and correct and just. So, federalism. I apologise that this is such a whistle-stop tour of Australian politics, but there's a lot to cover. So I've mentioned that Australia is a federal system. So federalism, if we've taken the, the Westminster system from the United Kingdom, federalism we've taken from the United States. So federalism is an American model that sets up a set of, of national government institutions. So we might in Australia call that the federal government or sometimes the Commonwealth government. Uh, and then under that there are any number of, of states. And the power to govern is distributed between the central and the state levels. That's the, um, what I referred to earlier is the, the, the division of powers between the, the federal government and the state government. Our constitution, the Australian constitution, specifies which area of lawmaking belongs to which level of government. So one of the reasons at the moment that there is a, a postal survey happening around the question of marriage equality is that marriage in the constitution is specified as an area of law that the, the federal government has responsibility for. Some states uh, have tried to, 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 to test that. 
They've made uh, their own laws relating to um, the, the, the recognition of um, same-sex marriages, but they can't go as far as calling uh, those state-based systems marriage because our constitution says marriage belongs to the federal government. And most areas of law are divided in that way. It might be education, which is primarily state-based, but where the, state, the federal government has some funding responsibility. Health is generally uh, a state-based system uh, of responsibility, although the federal government has some uh, responsibilities in relation to funding, particularly of public health. So in any federal system, that division of powers, the way those powers are divided between the two levels is specified in a written constitution. And that written constitution also includes the mechanisms of how to resolve conflicts between those two levels of government when they occur. And in Australia, um, the judicial body that is set up to interpret those and, and rule on those um, constitutional conflicts is the High Court. So if the states and the federal government come into disagreement about uh, some area of responsibility, the place they ultimately have to take that test if they can't resolve it is to the High Court um, that will make a, a ruling based on their interpretation of the constitution. Not surprisingly, one of the biggest areas of argument between the states and the federal government is money. The federal government collects all the income tax in Australia and all the GST. So every time you buy something and some GST is added into the, the cost of that, of that, all of that money goes into the federal government coffers. Similarly, income tax is paid to the federal government. The federal government then has most of the money, but then the constitution says the state governments have to deliver most of the services. So most of our education, most of our health comes from the state governments. So then there are arguments about which state should get how much money and how that should be calculated. So the GST revenue in particular has been a, a major source of argument since it was introduced in 2001 uh, because the bigger states argue that they should have, they should get more money um, even if they're already the wealthier states, whereas some of the poorer states, so Western Australia in particular, not a massive population, but they say they've got much bigger challenges because there's more territory, <coughs> less people, but bigger infrastructure challenges. So these arguments go on every year. The Constitution is the written document that sits over the top of this and is intended to provide a set of rules for arbitrating those disputes and a, a range of others. Has anyone here looked at the Australian Constitution ever? Oh, Bernadette, what a surprise, and you. Um, I'm going to say something controversial. I think it's one of the world's most boring constitutions. Really, really dull. If you haven't read it, I don't suggest it. Uh, enough that we have a chat about it, really. Um, its most important task, as I've said, is to provide this legal framework for the division of powers between the states and the federal government. It describes how our parliament works and the powers that it has, but interestingly, and this is another uh, aspect that we've drawn from the UK and from the Westminster system, not everything is written down in our constitution. So we have what are known as constitutional conventions, things that are not written down everywhere, but that everyone just understands that that's the way we do it. So, for example, our Prime Minister, not mentioned in the Constitution, there is no, there's no, no Prime Minister in the Constitution. The way in which we decide on our uh, Prime Minister, not mentioned in the Constitution. So, some important things missing. And then, a lot of other things that are very specific to the time in which the Constitution was written. It is a historical document and there are lots of ways in which it has not stood the test of time very well. I've already mentioned the fact that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are basically missing from our constitution, except for a couple of archaic pieces of law that say things like the states have the power to exclude any group from voting in an election on the basis of their race. That's not certainly something that we're going to tolerate in contemporary Australia. It's something that um, people have regularly proposed should be changed. But people are very anxious about changing our constitution and, as I'll come back to in a minute, it is very hard to change the Australian constitution. Importantly, I suspect for many of you, is the fact that the Australian constitution has no Bill of Rights. 
There are no rights explicitly protected in a Bill of Rights attached to our Constitution in the way that the US Constitution does. We have, over time, uh, found that there are some rights uh, through legal cases, and Bernadette might say more about that. So, for example, the High Court has repeatedly affirmed that we have freedom of political communication in Australia, that what we say politically can't be limited by um, our, our legal framework. But that's come about through case law, not through any explicit written protection in the Constitution. It is, as I said, a very hard document to change. Australia has tried to change our constitution 44 times through referenda, and we've passed only eight of those questions. The reason it's hard to change, the, the technical reason, is that it itself specifies that to pass a referendum in Australia, you must achieve what's called a double majority. So you must have a majority of people saying yes to the change, also in a majority of states. <coughs> So if four of the states said yes with a big majority, but the other states said no, uh, even if the overall majority was in favour of the change, the referendum would not pass. The most successful referendum in Australia was the 1967 referendum, uh, about which a lot has been written. It was hugely successful. Over 90% of Australians voted yes in that referendum, which was to make two very minor changes to the Constitution, again, in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Those two changes were that Aboriginal people could be counted in the census, rather than as they were up until that point, as flora and fauna under that piece of legislation. So it was significant in that it recognised Indigenous humanity. Uh, and the other change that it made was to transfer responsibility for making laws about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from the state governments to the federal government. That change has been very mixed in its defect for Aboriginal people. It was seen at the time as being a very positive thing, but we have had governments that have, um, for example, the Howard government in 2007 passed uh, a set of legislation in the Northern Territory that required the suspension of the Racial Discrimination Act and has been hugely problematic for Aboriginal people in that jurisdiction. So we do achieve change. Uh, when we do, it's something of a miracle and not, that change doesn't always play out the way that we, we think it will. To turn our attention now to the Parliament. So as I've mentioned, the Queen is technically the head of our Parliament, the head of state. Uh, I don't know if she'll ever come to Australia again, given her age, but when she does, we carry on and say, ooh, the head of state's here, and we come out and we, well, not me personally, but people come out and they line the streets and they give her flowers, and it's quite a big deal. Um, but really, she hasn't been involved in, oh, the British monarchy hasn't been involved in the governing of Australia really since Federation, but absolutely not since 1986. The Queen's representative in Australia is the person known as the, the Governor-General. Uh, the Governor-General is appointed by the Prime Minister of the day, although obviously with the seal of approval of the, the, the British royal family. And that role is largely symbolic. So our Governor-General, as the Queen's representative, opens more flower shows than they engage in uh, political debate. So they're a figurehead rather than a political actor. But nonetheless, Technically, they open Parliament every sitting. Our Parliament is what's known as a bicameral system, which is a strange word, but it basically just means we have two Houses of Parliament. All the states and territories in Australia are also bicameral, except for Queensland, which is strange in so many ways. Queensland just has, the Queensland Parliament just has one house. In the federal system, these names change a little bit in the, in the states, if that's ever confusing for you. But we have the House of Representatives, which we also refer to as the lower house. This is where the government is drawn from, and I'll explain that in a minute. And the Senate, which is the upper house, uh, also described as a house of review. So legislation can't pass through the parliament without going through both houses of parliament and being approved by both houses of parliament. And the, the, the Senate perf performs a really important um, check and balance on Australian democracy by providing that review function. Our parliamentarians are elected through a system of representative government. So the idea is that rather than each of us representing our own political interests, uh, which is 
something that's debated much in political theory. We hand over our representative um, power to, to, to someone we've chosen to represent us, to stand for us in making those decisions. In, in lower houses that in Australia, in, in the federal parliament and in the state parliaments, the members of the lower house are, are local representatives. So I live over in Fitzroy. My local member is Adam Bant. He sits for the seat of Melbourne. So most of you probably uh, know which, which seat you live in and hopefully you can name your local member. Hopefully you can even name what political party they're from and then we can have a really interesting conversation. So that's the way we elect our, our lower house. I'll come back to the Senate. It's more complicated. Really important to understand is that this is not a presidential system. So the, our Prime Minister is not elected through a separate ballot in the way that the President of the United States is. The Prime Minister is very simply the leader of the party that wins the majority of seats in the House of Representatives. So the party that wins the, the biggest number of seats in the House of Representatives is the party that wins the right to form a government and the person who leads that party is automatically the Prime Minister. It's not, up, it's not up for question. There's no other question to be asked. Their party might choose to dump them once they're Prime Minister. We've had a lot of that in Australia in the last 10 years. Um, but they will be replaced by the new leader of that party that still holds the majority in the, the House of Representatives. It doesn't trigger a new election if the Prime Minister is dumped. Our elections, well, they're complicated. I'm not going to do justice to explaining these to you in the few minutes that I've got left. Lots of key points to know. We don't have fixed terms. Some states do. Victoria does, New South Wales does. There's a bit of a trend towards setting fixed terms, which says the next election will be held on this day in three years, and then the next same day on three years, or whatever. Uh, in, in our federal politics, it's much more of a guessing game and it becomes very much a political game. The government that's in power, the party that's in power, has the right to call an election within certain parameters, so they can't go too early and they can only be in power for up to three years, but there's quite a big window in there. And uh, around about now, or particularly as soon as next year starts, we're going to enter into a guessing game about when the next federal election is going to be. The earliest that I've heard predicted is August next year. Uh, the most recent prediction I've heard is uh, May 2019. That's an enormous window and during that time there will be endless speculation about when uh, the Prime Minister, should it still be Malcolm Turnbull, is going to call the next election. Our elections still tend to be dominated by two, uh, the two older parties. Some people call them major parties. We have uh, broadly speaking on the centre-left of politics, the Australian Labor Party, uh, and on the right, broadly speaking, we have the Liberal Party which governs in coalition with the National Party. So you may often hear reference to the coalition government and think, what is this coalition party? The coalition is, uh, is a, a combination of the Liberal Party and the National Party. The National Party is a minor party that historically has represented farmers and rural interests. So the Liberal Party, even though it has been in power for much more of Australia's political history, can't actually govern on its own. It can only govern uh, in, in combination with the National Party. It needs their seats in order to have that majority. The Australian Labor Party, when it does win government, um, governs on its own mostly, although we've had a couple of hung parliaments. We also have important minor parties. Perhaps the most significant is, uh, is the Greens, uh, which have held the balance of power with, uh, with, with major parties at, at various points in time. Uh, quite distressingly, in the last federal election, we saw the return of Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party uh, to, to the federal parliament. Um, we have different electoral systems, election systems, electoral systems for this, the Senate and the House of Representatives, just to make it even more confusing for you. So I've mentioned that in the House of Representatives, where across the nation we have 150 seats. So we've carved up, the, the Australian Electoral Commission has carved up Australia into 150 seats 
and when we go to vote on election day, we all vote for someone who will represent us in our local area. The Australian Electoral Commission has very complicated sets of formula that look at how many people live in, that, in, in a particular seat. Uh, those boundaries change between elections as the Australian Electoral Commission reviews that to make sure that those seats are more or less the same size and so we achieve representation that way. The Senate is chosen entirely differently. So in our upper house we have uh, only 76 senators and we have a system of proportional representation. So each, uh, each state is divided into, uh, well in the case of states, 12 um, portions and uh, in each territory is divided into two. So it doesn't matter if you live in Tasmania, which is geographically tiny and has a really small number of people, you're still going to have 12 senators, just like Victoria or New South Wales does with much bigger numbers of people. So some people say that that's unfair and unrepresentative. Other people say that because we also have a different way of counting the votes in the Senate, what we achieve in that House of Review is a more diverse group of people. And that's a good thing for democracy because uh, whereas in our parliament, uh, the, the lower house has tended to be dominated by a particular type of people, white middle class men, not all that surprisingly. Uh, in the Senate, we've had, we've had more diversity, and that's a good check, again, on our, on our uh, democratic system. Oh, my goodness, that's the end. Okay, from politics to law. Uh, this is me. I am the director of the Melbourne Social Equity Institute and uh, we work to support research that helps to combat disadvantage in one way or the other. And I'm pictured here with my dog. He's called Toby. He's the social equity dog. We work here on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, but most of the time I work on the lands of the Bunurong people, which is down by the ocean, south east of Melbourne. Beautiful place. And we're very happy there. And that's where I get most of my research and writing done. When I'm here in the office, I have a lot of meetings. Charlene is the person who goes out and does a lot of the work around the university, meeting people, bringing people together. And I'm really delighted to be part of this lecture series. And I'm moving around to make sure the video cameraman can chase me. <laughs> right. Okay, so you've already seen this slide. Uh, as Sarah has explained perfectly well, we have this idea of a constitutional democracy or constitutional monarchy. Democracy means that the people get to elect our parliament our members who will represent us, as Sarah has explained. So we have the parliament that makes the law. We then have judges, the legal system that interprets the law, and we have the executive government made up of ministers and uh, a bureaucracy uh, beneath them, full of public servants who try to carry out the laws. So that's a very simplified version of it, but I think it generally works well most of the time. And as Sarah has said, the Constitution sets out the division of powers in our federal system. So Australia has six states and two territories, each with its own set of laws. We also have a federal or commonwealth system which also has a law. Now for some years I taught criminal law in Australia. There are nine different sets of criminal law. So each state, the two territories and the commonwealth have a criminal law. Often it's in a criminal code or in a criminal law act. And sometimes we get to compare 
because each law is different across Australia. And for academics, for researchers, there's a wealth of material because these laws are very different in different states and different territories. I wanted to just mention international law very briefly because many of you will know that there are conventions, there are treaties at the international level, but they don't become part of Australian law, domestic law, unless the government specifically enacts them. So we can ratify international treaties, which means that we think that they're a good thing, that we would like to be bound by them, but unless Parliament actually passes each part of that treaty into domestic law, we're not actually officially bound by those laws. That compares to other countries such as France, whereby as soon as France ratifies a convention or treaty, it is part of French law. So they're just different ways of incorporating international law into our country. Right, so you can just um, perhaps read through that, that slide and get an idea of how international law isn't immediately part of Australian law, even though we may ratify a convention. Okay, so we have a lot of law, many, many laws in Australia. We have local laws, sometimes called bylaws, we have state laws, we have territory laws, and we have Commonwealth laws. Sometimes it's very difficult to know which law is actually the relevant one. And that's why we need lawyers. <laughs> we can go to them to say, what are we bound by? And lawyers will try to interpret what the parliament has set out. We sometimes also refer to different types of law. Common law or judge-made law is where the courts interpret the acts that parliament has passed. So judges get the final say on what the law means. But we also have statutory law, which is law passed by parliament. So you have, for example, here in Victoria, the Criminal Law Act. That's a law passed by parliament. And I'll show you in a moment a uh, little film clip about how these statutes get passed. So there's, they intersect sometimes but that's generally two different types. And then other types are, for example, criminal law, where if, for example, you punch someone, that's an assault, and the state actually prosecutes you for committing an assault. Okay, it's not the other person bringing an action, it's the state that brings the action and the state decides to punish. Now, I'm using the state here to mean the government or the country, okay? I'm not using it to mean the state of Victoria as such. And here in Victoria, we have an Office of Public Prosecutions. So they decide when to prosecute a person for committing a crime. If you punch another person and that person suffers damage, they have medical bills, they might want to bring a civil action. So civil law is generally where an individual sues another person. So that can be in contract, it can be in tort law, the, that's the law of negligence, or it can also be in a form of assault. So you're asking to be compensated. That person hit me, I want my medical expenses paid for. That's a civil action under civil law. 
So there is a connection sometimes between the two. All right, I'm going to show, hopefully, this is where we cross our fingers, a video of how a law is made by Parliament. This particular video was made in 2012. So you'll see our former Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, in this. You'll also see a number of ministers in Parliament. And you'll see the inside of Parliament House in Canberra. Making a law. One of the main roles of the Parliament is to make laws for the people of Australia. Under Australia's constitution, the Federal Parliament makes laws on important national matters such as defence, immigration, taxation and even marriage. A proposal for a new law, or a change to an old one, is called a bill. Most bills are introduced into the Parliament by government ministers and usually begin here in the House of Representatives. I therefore introduce the Tax Laws Amendment Temporary Flood Reconstruction Levy Bill and I do so with great pride. Once a bill is introduced, members can debate the bill and then vote on it. The Coalition is not opposed in any way, shape or form to the rebuilding and repair of infrastructure and we want to see Australia get back on its feet as quickly as possible. Australia will become a leader in best practice organ donation for transplant. Every day waiting for the phone call to announce the possibility of a transplantation. All those who've got opinion say aye, to the contrary no. I think the eyes have it. If the bill is agreed to in one house, it is sent to the other house. In this case, the Senate, where a similar process is followed. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. The tax laws amendment Demand for organ and tissue donations is expected to increase further. Experiencing the enormous benefits of organ and tissue donations. I think the eyes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to establish the Australian Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation Authority. I ask leave of the House to move the amendments one to Members three. Members and Senators can suggest amendments to a bill if they think it needs changing. Uh, for this amendment. The immediate question is that the amendment be agreed to. These amendments are also debated and voted on. I think the eyes have it. About half of all bills are investigated more closely through the work of parliamentary committees. Either House of Parliament can send a bill to a committee for detailed examination. The evidence on the committee's inquiry into the Water Amendment Bill 2008. A committee might suggest changes to a bill or make other recommendations. The committee was mindful that the Parliament this process the helps the Parliament make the better informed that decisions. The final stage of making a law is approval by the Governor-General on behalf of the Queen. Before giving royal assent to a bill, the Governor-General must be satisfied that it has passed both Houses of Parliament. After the bill is signed, it becomes a law, called an Act of Parliament. Okay, so that gives you an idea of how a statute is made. So you could see the, the ministers and the members of parliament debating the different bills that then have to go through a process before they actually become an act of parliament or a law. So that's how a law is made. How is it interpreted? We have quite a complicated court system in Australia. So we have federal courts as well as state and territory based courts. In Victoria, for example, we have state courts. So the Supreme Court is the highest court in Victoria. The intermediate court is the county court. And underneath that is what we call the Magistrates Court. That's where most cases get heard. 
So the Magistrates Court has the largest number of cases coming before it, and I'll talk a little bit about what they hear shortly. We also have on the other side the Commonwealth Courts, the Federal Court, the Family Court and the Federal Magistrates Court. And this hears matters of federal relevance. Sitting above them all is the High Court of Australia, which is our highest court. There is no appeal from the High Court. That's a, a picture of our High Court in Canberra. It hears matters dealing with the Constitution, as Sarah has pointed out, but it also hears appeals from state Supreme Courts. There has to be a two-step process. So there's no immediate right to an appeal from the State Supreme Court. The judges have to consider whether there's a point of law worth hearing first. If an appeal gets past that, then the justices sit and consider what the decision should be. As I say, there's no appeal from the High Court of Australia. What this court says goes. It governs the rest of the court system. So sometimes we talk about precedent, that the High Court of Australia sets a precedent in how it interprets a law. This is the current bench of High Court Justices. So there are seven of them, three women and four men. And our Chief Justice is Susan Kiefel in the middle. The AC after their names is the highest honour that uh, Australia gives to people in our honours system. So you can see that they're very important people very well regarded, very uh, highly respected, and it's very, very difficult to become a Justice of the High Court of Australia. So that's the current uh, makeup of our court, and it's usually the most important cases where the seven Justices all sit together, and that's called the full bench of the High Court. Coming to Victoria, as I said, there's also a rather complex hierarchy of courts. This is our Supreme Court in William Street in Melbourne. You might have walked past it. This hears very serious criminal cases. So cases of murder get heard in the Supreme Court. Uh, very... Um, high-powered civil cases, so uh, cases involving a lot of money, also get heard in the Supreme Court. We have trial justices, whereby one judge can sit with a jury to decide uh, very serious cases, and there's also a court of appeal within the Supreme Court that oversees the deci decisions that might have been made by a trial judge. On the middle level is the County Court of Victoria, a nice new building. When I used to practice law, it didn't look like this at all. So it's very new, very well set out. And this hears the next level down of criminal offences. So it, it hears matters of um, burglary, very serious assaults, uh, very serious theft matters and so on. And also it hears civil law cases as well. So disputes about contracts, about uh, someone being negligent and so on. And then at the lowest level we have the Melbourne Magistrates Court and this is where most cases are heard. It has uh, numerous matters heard here by magistrates every single day. There are also other magistrates' courts dotted around Victoria and as part of 
this particular level, there are also what are called Koori courts, whereby Aboriginal people uh, sit and decide their own matters. We also have what's called a drug court. So it's a magistrate's court dealing exclusively with drug offences. And we also have what's called the ARC list, the assessment and referral court, which deals primarily with offenders who might have a mental health condition or some form of cognitive uh, disability. And instead of going through the, the normal court procedure, often these offenders will go through a diversion from the magistrate's court so they can get treatment or have their needs assessed. All right, so I just wanted to mention that we have uh, in Victoria and some other states uh, two types of lawyers. So we have solicitors, and they're the ones that, that basically deal with paperwork. They can provide advice. They're the person that you see first. And they deal with uh, both criminal and civil matters. But barristers are the ones who actually appear in court. And barristers undergo an extra uh, training. They have a mentor, they do another um, up to nine months, what's called reading, They're, they become a reader, it just means that they're trained in court procedure under uh, a mentor. And so in this picture, the person with the wig is the barrister standing up and presenting an argument. The person sitting here is a solicitor who would have done the initial paperwork and would have what's called briefed the barrister. Okay, so uh, worked out an argument, worked with the barrister, but the barrister is the one who presents that argument. We also have here in Australia what's sometimes called an adversarial system. An adversarial system. It means one side presents a case and the other side argues against it. The judge makes a decision. In other countries, they have what's called an inquisitorial system whereby the judge asks the questions and directs the hearing much more. But here we follow the English system of law in trials. So one side presents one case, one side, and the other one argues against it. The judge and sometimes the jury make the final decision. So that's a, a very uh, broad overview of our legal system. To find a lawyer, it can be quite hard. If you don't know uh, the system, who deals with what, the Law Institute of Victoria is always very helpful. If you have a legal matter, you can ring them and say, do you know of a solicitor who works in this area? And they can direct you. Victoria Legal Aid also supports people who aren't able to afford uh, to get a lawyer themselves. And we also have a Federation of Community Legal Centres who also can provide support without you having to pay a lot of money. So those community legal centres, here are some of them, uh, that deal with various uh, offences as well as civil matters, driving offences and so on, around Melbourne, in case you're interested in, in finding out a little bit more about uh, what advice you can get across Melbourne. Okay, so that's basically the legal system. To become a lawyer, it takes a long time. Here in, uh, at the University of Melbourne, students do an undergraduate degree first, and then they can do what's called a JD. So that's a graduate 
law degree before uh, they can practice. So it can take a long time. Uh, we do have a lot of lawyers uh, in Victoria and we have a lot of law schools and sometimes it can be difficult to actually practice law and sometimes people don't want to practice law but want to work uh, in, in various jobs such as in executive government or they can use their law degree to become uh, a politician. There are lots of politicians in Australia that have law degrees. So it can open up uh, different opportunities apart from just becoming a, a solicitor or a barrister. Okay, so that's the broad overview of an introduction to the legal system.